Oh, there it goes. All right, good evening, everybody. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I am Diane Lynch. I'm the Pease Public Library Director. And welcome to What is Happening in Ukraine. This is a joint event between the Pease Public Library and the Holderness Free Library. So thank you to the friends and the trustees of both the Pease Public Library and the Holderness Free Library for making this program possible. Thank you to Adam DeFilippe for co-sponsoring this event, Nicole Gavreau for suggesting the connection with Ms. McGorry, and also for providing technical support on Zoom tonight. A few housekeeping items before we begin. We are recording this program to make it available for viewing after this event. Uh, please feel free to type any questions you may have into the chat and we'll be on the lookout for them. Uh, also, if there is something that you feel you simply must uh, address at the time that the program is going on, you can unmute yourself and ask the question as we go along. Uh, we do ask that for audio clarity during the program, uh, you otherwise keep your microphones muted. I understand that Rebecca will be answering some questions at the program's end, um, time permitting. And now the moment that you really all have been waiting for. Ms. Rebecca Magori has an MS in Russian politics and society from King's College in London, an MA in conflict analysis and resolution from George Mason University, and an MS in conflict resolution and Mediterranean security from the University of Malta. She has worked for several years with a nonprofit organization that operated in Ukraine, and she spent a year and a half living and studying in St. Petersburg, Russia. She is currently a program officer at the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, one of the nine resettlement agencies for refugees in the United States. We thank her for taking the time to join us tonight and share her knowledge of, the, of this region and the conflict with us. Thank you, Rebecca, and welcome. Thank you, Diane. Um, as she said, I will be taking questions and I'll do my best to keep an eye on the chat as I go. Um, I do have a bit of a reputation for getting a little uh, single-minded. So if you've typed a question, you think it's relevant or urgent um, and I haven't acknowledged it, you can feel free, as she said, to unmute your mic um, and ask it. And I will do my best to answer in the moment. There will also be a time for a Q&A at the end. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get this started, so just bear with me here while I share my screen. All right. What's happening in Ukraine? So I understand um, that for obvious reasons, this is a pretty popular topic right now. I'm going to start out with um, just some very quick terminology for as we go along. Why Ukraine and not the Ukraine? The term the Ukraine is a remnant of the Soviet Union. So Ukraine in its native language means the country or the borderland. And it was referred to during the Soviet era as a part of the Soviet Union, the Ukraine, rather than as an independent country. Ukraine without the the is correct. And it's understandably very sensitive for Ukrainians in order to avoid implying that Ukraine is still just part of the Soviet Union or part of Russia. Uh, similarly, we can see over here why Kiev with a Y-I instead of the I-E that people are used to seeing. In Ukraine, there are two dominant languages. There's Ukrainian and there's Russian. In Eastern Ukraine, many people speak only Russian, but across Ukraine as a whole, most people speak both. The Russian word for Kiev written in English is K-I-E-V, Kiev. And the Ukrainian word written in English is Kiev with an, a Y-I. Both of these are technically correct in their respective languages, but K-I-E-V is the Russian term for the city and K-Y-I-V is the Ukrainian one. I'll be using the Ukrainian one in this, pre this presentation, um, but this is just so you know, it's the same city that you've probably been seeing in the news. So we'll start out um, with a very brief overview of the history. How are Russia and Ukraine related to each other? So some quick facts. At the core of the debate about which country is real is Kievan Rus. Uh, this country was, or empire, I should say, this empire was around from the year 879 to 1240. This is claimed by Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia as the root of their society and their culture. So Belarus and Russia both took the Rus from Kievan Rus. Uh, 
Its capital for the first three years was the city of Novgorod in what is now Russia. And after that, for the remaining 358 years that it existed, the capital was Kiev in what is now Ukraine. Russian and Ukrainian languages diverged after the fall of Kievan Rus. Prior to that, they were um, kind of an, an ancestral language, uh, Slavic language that occurred before either of them. In the 17th century, the Cossack Hetmanate rose, this is like the equivalent of a Ukrainian nation state. It briefly rose uh, and was then taken and divided between Russia and Poland, and then later by Russia alone. If we take a look at this map here, um, you can see Novgorod is in Russia. So this is really just a very small sliver of Russia considering how large Russia is. Um, beneath it, we can see Belarus. So it took up most of the country of Belarus and it took, we could say maybe a quarter of Ukraine where Kiev is now. Um, so that's kind of some of the ancient history. We're gonna fast forward to the 1900s, the 20th century. In 1917, inspired by the Russian Revolution, Central and Eastern Ukrainians broke away and formed what they called the Ukrainian People's Republic after centuries of Russian rule. So ever since the 17th century, when um, what was then Ukraine or the Cossack Hetmanate was divided between Russia and Poland. It didn't last very long. In 1922, the Ukrainian People's Republic was forcibly seized by the Russian army and annexed into the Soviet Union as the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. From 1932 to 1933, there occurred what's known as Holodomor. This is a Ukrainian famine that was caused by Russian seizure of Ukrainian grain to feed Moscow and Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg. Approximately 7 million Ukrainians died. It's very difficult to get a genuine estimate. There have been estimates between 3 and 10 million, but in general, 7 million tends to be um, the most commonly accepted number. To give a little bit more context for Holodomor, the famine originally started in Russia, in Moscow and St. Petersburg than Leningrad. Um, but what happened was in order to prevent starvation in these heavily populated cities, um, the Soviet government began diverting crane, sorry, began diverting grain from Ukraine. This is relevant because Ukraine actually has the most fertile land in the world um, and at that time was producing massive amounts of grain, plenty enough to prevent the famine that occurred. But because it was being taken from them immediately after it was grown and harvested, Ukraine's had access to none of the food that they were growing. Um, this understandably caused a massive scar and is perhaps the first really significant scar for Ukraine um, when it comes to the way that that they view Russia and when, when they view anything kind of Soviet related. So a few years later in 1939, Poland was divided between Nazi Germany and the USSR. What is now Western Ukraine was annexed to the USSR as well. In 1991, Ukraine declared independence during the fall of the Soviet Union. And then in 1994, under the Budapest Memorandum, Ukraine gave up all of its nuclear weaponry in exchange for a guarantee of protection from invasion. So these are um, just a handful of events, obviously from a very complicated history that I think provide a pretty good backdrop for um, what would eventually become the more contemporary events of the conflict. And that leads us here. So in 2004, we had what was called the Orange Revolution. Russian President Vladimir Putin assigned his personal election campaign to a man named Viktor Yanukovych. He was a pro-Russian candidate running for president in Ukraine at the time. Yanukovych's campaign was based on re-establishing relations with Russia. His opponent, Viktor Yushchenko, was poisoned but miraculously survived, um, although it has been impossible to confirm more or less all signs point to the poisoning occurring either as a direct result of Russian interference or um, from Yanukovych's campaign alone. 
Yanukovych won the election after the poisoning of Yushchenko. However, there was massive widespread fraud. This was similar in type and strategy to what we've seen in Russian presidential elections. So for example, refusing to let the observers view the ballot counting uh, and numbers in certain oblasts, which is uh, the equivalent of a state in Ukraine that were higher per county than the actual number of the population there. A massive protest erupted in Ukraine. It was called the Orange Revolution. Uh, this forced, thanks in part to um, international pressure for the election to be held again, this time under close supervision by international authorities. Viktor Yushchenko won by a very significant margin. margin. It was about 7%. From 2013 to 2014, we have Euromaidan, also known as the Revolution of Dignity by Ukrainians. After Yushchenko received extremely poor ratings as president, Yanukovych was actually elected in earnest. Um, so to contextualize this, Yanukovych won in 2004 fraudulently. Uh, they had the re-election, Yushchenko won, but he performed very poorly as president. And so at the end of his presidency, Yanukovych was genuinely elected. At the last minute in the fall of 2013, Yanukovych backed out of an agreement with the European Union for Ukraine to ascend to the EU and instead signed a last minute economic agreement with Putin. Protests erupted in Ukraine and continued on and off through February of 2014. A private police force called the Burkut violently suppressed them, especially in Kiev, with increasing severity. Um, there were approximately 100 deaths, and the majority of those, I think something like 85 of those 100 deaths, occurred between February 18th and February 20th. The Ukrainian protesters ultimately succeeded. Yanukovych fled the country and went to Russia, where he was promptly appointed mayor by Putin. And that brings us to 2014 to 2021, the immediate precursor to the current events um, and the fallout largely of the, the two events that we talked about previously, the Orange Revolution and Euromaidan. So in 2014, immediately after Yanukovych was ousted, Putin moved on Crimea right away. He sent Russian troops to cut it off from Ukraine and held what was very likely to be a staged referendum. I say likely staged because it's impossible to know for sure. However, most of the people that would have voted in this referendum were on house arrest at the time because there were Russian soldiers in the streets. Um, there have been leaked videos, for example, of empty polling stations. However, the numbers that were reported from this referendum were that 90 something percent of Crimeans had declared that they wanted to uh, leave Ukraine and be annexed by Russia. In response, the new Ukrainian government outlawed Russian TV and radio and moved to eliminate Russian as a language on official documents and in schools. The problem with this is that in eastern Ukraine, many people only speak Russian. Um, this was essentially a threat to deprive them of their own language, and they erupted into protests of their own. This provided an opportunity for Russia to insert some destabilization beyond what had already occurred. So Russia provided weapons, training, and in some cases, military support to separatist groups in Luhansk and Donetsk. This was the official beginning of the Russo-Ukrainian War. This effectively prevented Ukraine from ascending to the EU or to NATO. So this is a very um, important thing to note, and I think something that a lot of people miss. Engagement in ongoing active conflict disqualifies a country from being a candidate. So by forcibly continuing this conflict between Russia and Ukraine, Russia was more or less preventing Ukraine from being able to sign a new agreement to ascend to the EU or to join NATO. The Minsk Protocol briefly coordinated a ceasefire, but it collapsed by 2015. Minsk II was marginally more successful and most of the fighting stopped, uh, but Russian support continued on the ground in the east. Approximately 14,000 died in the ongoing war and the vast majority of them were prior to Minsk II.
Um, let's talk about escalation. I first want to define another term here. A security dilemma occurs when one country takes action to increase their security, and that makes another country feel insecure and do the same, leading to kind of a back and forth and an, an escalation of procedures. Uh, an example of this would be if one country felt insecure and put weapons right up against one of their borders, and then the country on the other side began to feel insecure because of the presence of these weapons and put their own weapons, but these ones were bigger and more deadly. This would lead the other country to bring not just more weapons, but soldiers. And we can see how this just gets higher and higher. And the longer it goes on, the more insecure both countries feel. So Ukraine was utilized by NATO and the EU in the ongoing security dilemma with Russia, escalating relations over a period of years. This kept the Russian invasion of Ukraine at bay, but heightened Eastern European tensions consistently. So what this means is that because of the security dilemma, it did make it very difficult for Russia to immediately pursue a, a more severe invasion. However, it also virtually guaranteed that this was eventually going to happen. In 2020, President Trump withheld arms from Ukraine unless Zelensky agreed to publicly investigate the Biden family. Zelensky refused to be involved, so Ukrainian aid was cut, and this created something of a window because the Ukrainian military was significantly more, um, more vulnerable and a bit weaker than had originally been anticipated. During this time, Ukraine became increasingly more anxious and desperate to join uh, both the EU and NATO to ensure protection from Russia. And slowly, both the EU and NATO became more amiable to the idea. Diplomats began talking about it more actively and the chance to kind of subvert this rule about active ongoing conflict to bring Ukraine into the fold. And that brings us to 2022. Afraid that Ukraine's ascension to NATO and the EU was imminent, Putin planned to frame Ukraine for a series of brutal events in order to justify the invasion. U.S. intelligence did manage to stay ahead of this and publicly outed Russia's plans, delaying their invasion several times. On February 24th, Putin lost patience, abandoned any type of justification that they had initially been planning and invaded Ukraine. Um, this was after several delays, but it's estimated that this was exactly one week after the original invasion was planned for. Um, the plan was to seize Kiev, assassinate Zelensky, and assume control over the Ukrainian government by day two. Uh, and most of the world seemed to think that they stood a very good chance of achieving this. But on February 26th, Ukrainian President Zelensky informed his advisors that it was likely the last day they would see him alive and then created something of a call to arms to all Ukrainians. So um, with the prospect of um, Russia taking Kiev kind of imminent, what they did was they emptied out all of their arsenals. They invited any Ukrainian to come um, and take guns, basically to, to empty them out so that there wouldn't be any warehouses full of weapons if Russia did take Kiev. Uh, and also so that even if it was militia style, Ukrainians would stand a chance even after um, loss of government control had occurred. On February 27th, Russia's planned overtake of Kiev failed. Um, so this was kind of the deadline that they had sought and that uh, a lot of the world had been convinced would be met. Uh, it failed largely due to the Ukrainian military defense tactic and supply chain problems. Ukrainian morale so soared in response and international aid began pouring in once it became clear that Ukraine stood more of a chance than what a lot of international leaders originally assumed. February 28th, the first round of negotiations between Russia and Ukraine occurred. Um, this has been an ongoing process, mostly um, diplomatically involved, so a lot of what we would call back-channel diplomacy, which means it might be the brother of a friend of a diplomat in Russia and the the cousin of another diplomat in Ukraine that first kind of um, make a connection and start talking and then slowly bring it up the line. Uh, one of the main goals of these, of course, was to establish a humanitarian corridor for several of the Ukrainian cities that have been under really severe fire. On March 8th, the first and thus far only successful humanitarian corridor was established and evacuated 3,500 citizens out of Sumy. I'm gonna talk about some of these um, cities more specifically in a minute. So Sumy will come back up. 
March 18th, the number of refugees hit 3.3 million and the number of internally displaced hit 6.9 million. So numbers are much higher now. I believe as of this morning, they're saying that more than 10 million people or about one in four Ukrainians have been forced to leave their home. So a couple of questions um, that people seem very curious about. So number one, should we be skeptical? And number two, should we be horrified? A little bit of skepticism is healthy during any conflict. Not every single report will be true. Some will be intentionally false and some will be accidentally false. However, in the case of Ukraine, the sheer number of news sources makes it a lot easier to find accurate information. So there's a lot of international news on the ground over there um, promoting several different viewpoints. And when we see a lot of consistency across them um, or even better footage, uh, it makes it a lot easier to kind of put, put the picture together. This is what sets this current conflict apart from a lot of other wars. We can confidently state as fact a few things. Number one, civilians and aid workers are being targeted by Russian forces, unfortunately. Number two, there have been thousands of Ukrainian civilian deaths and thousands of Ukrainian military deaths as well. Number three, there have been more Russian soldier deaths than Ukrainian deaths. I want to put a caveat in here right now um, that this is becoming a more and more difficult number to keep track of, especially with the ongoing tragedy in Mariupol which may very well have turned the tide of this. However, for the vast majority of it, it has seemed that the number of Russian soldiers that has fallen has um, outnumbered both Ukrainian soldiers and Ukrainian civilians that have been killed. Number four, Russian soldiers are in some cases intentionally sabotaging their own operations to avoid fighting. So for example, they are punching holes in their own fuel tanks to prevent them from being able to move along farther. Um, this is then compounded by some of the supply chain issues that I mentioned briefly earlier and we'll get to again pretty soon here. And number five, inside Russia, all reference to the war is currently punishable by prison time. The punishment in Russia is very steeply rising. Um, I believe right now, even referring to what's going on as a war is punishable by 15 years in prison up to, um, and thousands of dollars in fines are being levied on top of the thousands of arrests that are being made by those who are protesting. So here we just have some numbers. So 3,300,000 refugees have fled Ukraine. The vast majority of them are women and children. Um, this is partially because uh, men between the ages of 18 and 60 in Ukraine have been legally prevented from leaving. 1,100 missiles have been fired at Ukraine since February 24th. This number is actually a couple of days old also. I haven't been able to find a more recent one, um, but this is a massive, massive number. There have been 3,000 plus civilian deaths. When I talk about Mariupol here in a second, I'm, I'm going to describe why this number is 3,000 plus and why it is so difficult to get a good sense of how many civilians have died so far. So here we have a list of six cities that I think represent very different um, consequences of the war that's going on right now. Um, obviously, all of Ukraine is suffering, but um, I think that there is a misconception um, due to the news that all of the cities are facing kind of similar things. But in reality, the cities across Ukraine are facing very vastly different circumstances. Um, so I'm going to start with Kiev, the one that's right there in the middle, if you look towards the top. So most of the city is intact, but stores have run out or are running out of things like drinkable water, because while supplies haven't been cut off, they've been dramatically reduced. Missiles have managed to hit several buildings and several others have been deflected, including one that was aimed at a riverbank that would have kicked up radioactive sediment from the fallout of Chernobyl. If this had been successful, it would very likely have kicked up a radioactive cloud similar to uh, what occurred after Chernobyl itself. This cloud would then have traveled more than likely across Europe um, and, and become a much larger radioactive disaster. 
There remain Russian infiltrators in the streets, so there is some fighting. Um, many people are spending all day and night in metro stations due to air raid sirens. And although the Russian line of tanks, the convoy that's been in the news quite a bit, is heavily stalled, they are not very far outside of the city. And um, the reality is that absent a negotiated solution, Kiev will eventually come under a much more active attack. The next one that I'm going to go to is called Kharkiv. Um, if you follow to the right or to the east of Kiev, just about straight over, you will see Kharkiv very close to the Russian border. This is the second biggest city after Kiev, and this is where most of the pictures that have been in the media recently are coming from. Um, it is under a nonstop onslaught by Russian missiles. Kharkiv is strategically very important for a few reasons. Um, not only is it large, it has a very large and important international airport. It's close to the Russian border, and it is also the, um, the largest city of its size by far that is that close to eastern Ukraine. So as a threshold, it would be extremely valuable for Russian forces to utilize. Um, there's been significant infrastructural damage, and despite repeated assurances by Russian forces, a humanitarian corridor has been impossible to establish just yet, so many people remain trapped in Kharkiv. Russians have not taken the city, so to speak, but they are still fighting very hard for it, and their current strategy could be considered similar to what's known um, infamously as scorched earth policy it's either going to be th theirs or it's going to be unusable. Um, this is a very similar strategy that they are applying to Mariupol. I'll get to that in just a second here, but first I'm going to go straight back over to the west to Lviv, which is very close to the Polish border. It's currently acting as a hub for most internally displaced people fleeing their cities and also refugees who are able to take the bus from Lviv directly into Poland, which is where most refugees are going. Um, because it is in the West, it has been largely unhit up until recently. Um, we did see Russia begin to amp up a lot of the attacks in Western Ukraine. So for example, the attack on the military post in Lviv that killed 35. But for the most part, this is where a lot of internally displaced people who are unwilling to leave Ukraine, even if they're forced to leave their cities, are staying. Um, a lot of them are sleeping in basements or on living room floors, for example, of other people who live there. Lviv is um, a, a very narrow city. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, so it has a, a lot of um, very kind of skinny buildings. And obviously, not only does that make it um, a very dangerous target if a missile were to hit because it would it would spread to much more than it would in a widely dispersed city. But it also means that the sheer numbers that are coming into Lviv are leaving a massive housing shortage. Next, we're going to go all the way down to the bottom where there's Kherson. Oh, did I just hear someone's, did someone have a question? I think it was just a, a brief mic, so I'll keep going. So Kherson is a much smaller city. Um, there are less than 300,000 people who live there, and it's strategically important because it's a port city. It's receiving a lot of attention in Ukraine right now for its very brave and spirited citizens. So this is a city that we're really not seeing very much of in our news, but it is very, very famous within Ukraine and, and in Ukrainian news. Um, for example, there are images and videos going around of citizens of Kherson who knelt in the streets in front of Russian tanks to stop the onslaught because they had nothing else to stop them with. Um, they're also staging massive protests around Russian tank convoys. Uh, and more recently, they became very famous because a group of farmers went out to tend to the fields anyway, regardless of the conflict. Um, a few days ago, the Kremlin claimed that Russia had taken control of Kherson. This is, was not the first time that it had been claimed, and it's actually still now unconfirmed. Um, there are rumors, of course, from both sides. More likely, it's still kind of being fought for. That is, Ukrainian troops have not abandoned it yet, but it does seem that Russia currently has the upper hand. <laughs> 
And the next one is Mariupol. Mariupol has been extensively in the news recently, and this is where the vast majority of casualties currently are. Uh, Mariupol is a strategic holdout as one of the largest cities in Donetsk, so it's actually the second largest, and Russian forces are attacking it more or less indiscriminately with missiles. Around 2,500 were confirmed dead in Mariupol alone out of the 3,000 that were confirmed. However, I want to note that this was prior to the bombing of the theater four days ago and the school yesterday. Uh, the theater was suspected to have approximately 1,300 women and children trapped beneath the rubble. Uh, because of the ongoing missiles, it was impossible to go in and attempt to rescue any of them. And after four days, they are more or less all presumed dead. And although it's unclear what kind of deaths or casualties have resulted from the bombing of the school yesterday, there were estimated to be approximately 400 um, either in, in the school still or trapped beneath it. The mayor of Kherson has indicated that it's extremely difficult to count casualties and the number in, um, sorry, <laughs> the mayor of Mariupol has indicated that it's very difficult to count casualties and the number may be all the way up to 20,000 so far. Um, it's been approximately a week and a half, two weeks that Kherson has run completely out of food and water and there has been no electricity. Red Cross attempts to bring aid into the city were attacked um, and the Red Cross outpost was destroyed by a Russian missile, which unfortunately led the Red Cross to abandon its mission. Despite initial success over a week ago, um, so the, the city of Mariupol is currently most desperately in need of evacuation right now, I would say out of all of the cities across Ukraine. But once again, repeated negotiations for a humanitarian corridor have failed because uh, Russian forces have continuously attacked those who are attempting to flee. And the last city, if you go all the way to the top, the topmost, also very close to the Russian border, is the city of Sumy. Um, this is another incredibly hard hit city right now. It's also the one that had the successful, very brief um, evacuation uh, via a humanitarian corridor on March 8th. This was among the first city um, and region, so just to clarify, an oblast, which is like a state in Ukraine, they're very often named after the same city as the capital. So in this case, Sumy is the city, but it's also the name of this state. It was one of the first to be completely cut off by Russian forces from the rest of Ukraine, including a nearby city called Konotop, um, which is also in Sumy Oblast. Um, there are unfortunately reports and eyewitness accounts and unfortunately even some very disturbing video, which I understandably will not be sharing today, of uh, citizens attempting to independently leave Sumi and Russian tanks firing at cars, even cars full of children, for example, using anti-tank weapons. Um, this scared the vast majority of them into staying put. There are people who have successfully evacuated from Sumi on foot, but those with kids especially have um, been frightened into remaining in bunkers and metro stations for days or even weeks at this point on end. So um, I, I recognize that this was a, a very grave description, but I hope this kind of conveys how different areas of Ukraine, while all of them are certainly suffering, they're facing very different circumstances. And so a question um, that has been on a lot of uh, minds right now, especially those who are interested in politics, is why wasn't it easy? It should have been easy, right, for Russia to take Ukraine. So the first is that Russian soldiers weren't told that they were invading until just before the invasion began. They were ill-prepared and frightened, um, so they had been told for the most part that they were only there to do practice drills, the same as what um, the Russian government told the media. Many of the soldiers are between the ages of 18 and 22, so the vast majority are also very inexperienced. Second one is that the Ukrainian government had time to prepare and Ukrainian morale is very high. Their soldiers are exceptionally motivated. 
see we have, it looks like somebody in the chat. So we see sometimes it is said that if the invader does not win, it will lose. And if the Ukrainians don't lose, they will win in the long term. What do you think about the balance of forces now and in the near future? I'm actually going to put this question on pause because a later slide is going to address it in part. Um, but I will come back to this at the end and kind of add on to what the slide is going to get. So I will not forget you. Um, I'm just going to briefly, briefly set it aside. Uh, so number three, the Ukrainian soldiers offer food and housing to Russians who defect. Some EU countries have begun offering amnesty and asylum to Russian soldiers who refuse to fight. There have been videos, for example, of um, Ukrainians offering Russian soldiers phones to be able to call their parents, many of whom had no idea that they were in Ukraine because, again, officially speaking, most of them are still doing practice drills at the border. Ukrainians began destroying and removing road signs, leaving Russians unable to navigate their destinations. This is quite interesting. Um, Ukraine is extremely difficult to navigate. I can uh, testify to that firsthand. And Ukrainians are very intuitive when it comes to the country um, and when it comes to being able to navigate because many Ukrainian cities and towns are, are just collections essentially of villages. And if anybody wants to go to a store or a restaurant, they have to, to leave their area and go down several winding roads to a completely different region. Um, so for Russians who are not familiar with the area, it's extremely easy for them to uh, get disoriented. There are massive issues with Russian supply chains. Fuel refills get lost or never arrive. And as I mentioned earlier, Russian soldiers sabotage their own. The world did not expect Ukraine to last beyond the first couple of days. Once those days passed, the world began pouring aid into Ukraine, which is sustaining the military. And last, Ukraine has an extremely large and very involved international diaspora that has also poured funding, medical support, and military support into Ukraine, as well as um, leading protests and pressuring their own governments to take action. Uh, so now let's talk about some of the ramifications of the conflict um, and the consequences of the war. We'll start with Ukraine. Thousands have died and thousands more are likely to die, including civilians, aid workers, and soldiers. Uh, infrastructure repair costs will be in the billions at the very least. There are some families who have been separated who are unlikely to be reunited even if the war were to end tomorrow. If Russia takes Kyiv, the death of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is likely. He would then be replaced by a Russian selected leader. And this is significant because the dynamic of the war would then change to something of a civil war. So we would have the Ukrainian army or parts of the Ukrainian army fighting against its illegitimate leader who is now sitting in, in the presidential position and their Russian resources. Um, obviously this is significant for several reasons, but the most obvious one is that this would drastically impact the amount of aid that countries are able to send to Ukraine because most countries have very specific rules regarding not being allowed to take one side or another in a civil war. Um, so on, on top of the many other strategic purposes that eliminating Zelensky would, would foster and represent is the simple fact that um, forcing Ukraine into a civil war as opposed to what it is now would um, very dramatically move the outcome in Russian favor, even if nothing else changed. Ukraine has lost nearly 7% of its population through fleeing refugees. So a country of 44 million, it's approximately 7% have left the country already. This number is continuing to go up and will continue to go up. Many in Donetsk and Luhansk do identify as Ukrainian. So in the event that the war ends with Donetsk and Luhansk being seized or annexed by Russia, there would then be a second flow of refugees um, who did not want to give up their Ukrainian passport who would then be forced to move west as well. 
And last, as Russia becomes increasingly desperate, the ferocity of the attacks will increase. Russia went from what looked like an assured victory to what now looks like a likely loss in its current trajectory. The use of chemical weaponry, nuclear reactor sites, and framing Ukrainian soldiers to justify Russian attacks are all potentially imminent. Um, I'm gonna take a second to expand a little bit on those. So obviously, um, we've seen in the news recently that uh, the Russian government has accused the Ukrainian government of chemical weaponry and bioweaponry, and this is what's known as a false flag, um, which is a strategy that has historically been used very often by Russia to indicate what their next stance is. So they accuse another country of doing it to then justify them doing it themselves. Um, so that's the first indication that chemical weaponry may very well be the, the next step in the escalation. Uh, three nuclear sites so far in Ukraine have been targeted um, and to kind of varying degrees of success. But the reason that this particular um, uh, method is significant is that in the event that a nuclear reactor site were to explode, for example, it would create a nuclear disaster very similar to if a bomb had been dropped. However, Russia would not have to take credit for using nuclear weaponry, even though it would be the same result. Um, another thing that we've been seeing is Putin kind of becoming more desperate himself. So um, I'll, I'll chat a little bit um, about this, I think, towards the end. But it's important to note here that Putin is very famous for being very calm and very calculating. And uh, recently in his interviews, he's been increasingly more emotional, increasingly more frustrated. Um, this not only makes him less predictable, but also indicates that uh, he himself kind of feels boxed into a corner right now and is more likely to take drastic action, um, more drastic, I should say, than what's already been done. I'm going to move on now to consequences for Russia. Though Putin has utilized mass fraud in elections, it is also true that in every election thus far, he received a genuine majority of votes. So the fraud that he was utilizing was only to increase the margin that he won by. So for example, if he won 57% uh, of the votes, the official vote would say that he had won 69% to make it look like he was more popular than he was, even though he genuinely was winning the elections. Now his popularity is sharply decreasing among those who have access to information about Ukraine, but it's increasing among supporters and those who don't have access to this information or just don't believe it. Sanctions and bank cutoffs have crippled the Russian economy, but unfortunately does not impact Russian military capability. So this is important. There is still a lot of money in Russia. Putin is suspected to be the single wealthiest man in the world, and he stores a lot of his wealth in, um, for lack of a better term, the pockets of oligarchs. So many of the oligarchs that are exceedingly wealthy are in fact kind of just harboring his personal, his personal fortune. So although there is all of this money in Russia, it's not in the hands of most Russians, many of whom are now in very dire economic situations. Um, the implications of this are that these sanctions are a strategy to encourage Russians to rebel against Putin internally. So in other words, if Putin wanted to single-handedly fund this military um, for several years all by himself, he would be able to. First of all, the military is already quite well equipped. They uh, have no shortage of weaponry and it's not going to disappear anytime soon. Um, and in terms of being able to pay soldier pensions, not that that's a, a particularly uh, important factor for the Russian government to begin with, but there is no shortage of money to, to throw at it. The idea of sanctions really only does harm to Russian citizens with the idea that they will eventually be fed up and have had enough um, and take internal action on their own. This is understandably a pretty controversial strategy. Uh, many who have passports are fleeing Russia. Many others in the thousands are protesting and being arrested or detained inside their home. Um, and I mentioned this very, very 
um, briefly a moment ago, but under increasingly desperate conditions, Putin is likely to behave increasingly more erratically, and we're seeing this. This means more punishment for Russians, more severe attacks on Ukraine, and threats to the international community, which he may or may not follow through with. So, for example, his threats of catastrophic consequences. Um, a lot of this may very well be said in anger. That doesn't mean that he won't follow through with them, but at this point, because he is deviating so much from um, his um, his typical very cold exterior. It's becoming very difficult to see where he draws the line, and it's becoming increasingly more likely that there isn't really a line for him to cross anymore. Um, the last consequences we're going to talk about are the consequences for Europe and the U.S., uh, Poland is currently taking in the vast majority of all refugees, so approximately 1.8 million out of the 3.3 million so far. Many of them are then traveling to other locations, um, but many others are staying. In the event that the war does not end quickly, a structure will be put in place to divide refugees up among other European countries, the US and Canada. This, generally speaking, isn't random. They do try to um, keep families together, and so very often they will go to a country where they already have family, friends, or other connections. In the US, we call them US ties. European and NATO involvement is not impossible if Russia targets a convoy, files a missile, in, fires a missile into EU territory, whether intentionally or unintentionally, or uses significant chemical or nuclear weaponry. But absent these conditions, and possibly even under these conditions, they are likely to refuse to engage. European and US economies will also continue to be damaged due to fractured economic relations with Russia and Belarus and potentially with China as well. However, gas and oil prices will stabilize in um, probably between two and seven weeks from now based on factors independent of the war. So um, this is very typical in wartime economies, even uh, when it comes to wars and conflicts that are not oil related or that don't involve a country that exports significant amounts of oil. Uh, but in a conflict and war where the word oil is constantly being thrown around in the news, it does definitely open up a pathway for oil companies to um, massively jack up prices, um, blame it on inflation and so forth. What we are very likely to see is that even though the um, oil, the price of oil is drastically going down, gas prices will not follow it very quickly. And even when they do eventually stabilize, even if the price of oil is lower than it originally was before the conflict started, it's likely that the gas prices will stabilize at a higher level, higher price. So how do we help? Um, there are a few things we can do. Number one is to donate if you're able. Rasm for Ukraine, um, you can find them at rasmforukraine.org, is at the forefront of American efforts to provide humanitarian aid to Ukrainians on the ground. They are a long established and trusted organization with partners in Ukraine. I've also worked with them in the past. Uh, number two is to remember to treat Russians and Ukrainians kindly. The Ukrainian diaspora in the U.S. is suffering massive trauma. You can reach out to your community to ask if you can help. But also, do not ostracize or harm Russian people, many of whom are also very scared uh, and completely unrelated to what the president of a country that they already left is doing. Uh, another important thing to note here is that if uh, aggression against ethnic Russians does occur around the world, this would also give Russia a foothold to insist that they must protect their own against aggression. Um, it would, in other words, justify the um, kind of half-written excuse that they've been going with this entire time. So not only just from a, a humane standpoint, but even from a political standpoint, it's, it's important that we are not proving them correct in this instance and giving them any additional reason to behave aggressively. And number three is to calmly talk about it. So spread what you know and talk about it with your friends, families, and your students if you're a teacher. Use trusted news sources and don't allow your personal fear to dictate your morals or opinions. What I mean by this is that when there are um, very significant, violent, or brutal um, things that we're seeing in the news every day, it can very understandably evoke uh, a sense of fear, a sense of panic. 
Um, it can lead people to say things like, well, we can't interfere, we'd be risking a world war, or I feel bad for them, but there's nothing that we can do. When in reality, it's, it's very important to focus on the fact that we currently aren't in danger. So the focus needs to remain on the people who are currently experiencing this, the people who are already vulnerable. Um, and the, the, the secondary reason behind this is also to ensure that um, social pressure isn't interfering with what would otherwise be pretty sound diplomatic decisions. As we all know, um, obviously, people have the ability to sway their government in one direction or the other. But in times of crisis and times of panic, it can very often have the opposite effect of what was intended. So remaining calm, um, thinking about it straight, and keeping the focus on those who need it right at this moment are all very important ways to navigate talking about a conflict like this. All right, and now I am going to open the floor up for a Q&A, but first I'm going to address the question that was already in the chat. I'm gonna read it out loud again. Sometimes it is said that if the invader does not win, it will lose. And if you, the Ukrainians don't lose, they will win in the long term. What do you think about the balance of forces now and in the near future? This is um, a, a very interesting question, and it's also very difficult to answer in part because of how um, erratic and frankly unpredictable Putin's behavior is right at this moment. I do think that on its current trajectory, Ukraine has the upper hand. Um, and I do think that if this becomes a long-term war, that Ukraine um, would be almost guaranteed a victory because it's very difficult to reestablish supply lines after they've already been damaged in the way that they have. Russian morale uh, among soldiers was never very high and it is flagging, whereas Ukrainian morale is very sharply increasing. Uh, in terms of military weaponry, I think, uh, you know, it's very... It's true and obvious that Russia certainly has the upper hand when it comes to this. But I think that one of the mistakes that people make is comparing numbers and types of weapons when trying to determine who's going to win a war. Um, if superiority and technology of weaponry were what determined every war, we would have seen very different outcomes in the Korean War, for example, and in the Vietnam War. Uh, in this case, knowing the lay of the land and being motivated, um, the fact that Zelensky, for example, has remained behind and, and is constantly, you know, every few hours, making sure that he is contacting people on social media and releasing videos. It's all having kind of a combined effect of making Ukrainians feel very confident and very brave. And I think that that is going to be make a massive difference going forward. Uh, I can't predict the future, but I do think that it is a far more balanced war than anybody was willing to give it credit for in the beginning. Uh, and I think that if Putin were to take action in a much more drastic way than he already has, he would have to do so very carefully to avoid um, forcing more or less the West or NATO or the EU alone to get involved. And I don't think that Putin is being very careful right now. So I don't see him being able to kind of scrape together that, that kind of finesse that would be required. I hope that answers your question, but if it doesn't feel free to um, reiterate or turn your mic on. I'm also going to stop sharing my screen now unless anybody asks me to go back to a slide um, and we'll just switch to Q&A now. Rebecca, thank you so much. What a fascinating, comprehensive overview. And I just constantly am reminded how much I don't know about <laughs> everything <laughs> in the <laughs> world. Um, Wow, it's kind of taking a moment to digest all that information. <laughs> That's um, fair. I, yeah, I don't know where to begin. One of the questions that I had, and it will give me a moment to ask my question while folks kind of um, come up with their own. I know that you specifically are working with refugees at this time, and you had mentioned that you try to send refugees to places where they already have ties. Um, but to have a tie in the US, that's a, the US is a, such an enormous nation. Um, are you able to keep families together? You know, that's, I mean, the U.S. 
that's a big target, the US. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the resettlement structure is actually a bit broader than I implied there. So there's several levels to it. Um, when refugees arrive to the US, they've already been kind of um, assigned and they've been kept together as a case already. So what happens with refugees is they start off being processed by UNHCR. UNHCR um, then does kind of the preliminary vetting and determines, you know, who has families where and what numbers are each country willing to take in in a, a calendar year, for example. So if we were to just give an example of uh, a group of seven, maybe five of them are family members, and then there's a married couple who's very close friends with them, maybe lived with them before. They would report to the uh, UNH, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nicole. Um, they would report to the UN as a single case, and then the UN would then determine where this case of seven is going to go. If, for example, one of them had a brother that lived in the United States, they would be far more likely to be assigned to the United States. Um, and once they arrived, that's where we would take over. That's where the nine resettlement agencies come in. So we're told um, these, these clients have arrived and they have a brother in the city of Cleveland. So we're sending these seven to Cleveland. And then there's an office in Cleveland that would take over the resettlement process. So every effort is made to make sure that people who want to stay together do stay together. I personally haven't heard of a case where um, anybody wasn't able to do that. However, if we have a larger family or a larger case size, it can take longer for them to be assigned somewhere because it takes longer to vet all of them and it takes longer to find a site that can handle, for example, a family of 12 arriving one day. It looks like we've got some other uh, questions. Yes. All right. Uh, can you see them? Yes, I can. Um, so Quentin and Marcia Blaine asked, can you talk a little more about the role of Zelensky? Was he expected to be as effective as he is? This is a phenomenal question and very, very interesting. When Zelensky was first elected, um, I don't want to say that he was disliked. Um, the, the quote that I can remember very, very distinctly from uh, a community leader in Ukraine who is a very good friend of mine. He said um, he is not as good as we hoped, but better than we feared when he was first elected. So there were much worse options, um, but they, they kind of felt that there were better options and that he wasn't going to be as aggressive in confronting things like police um, corruption, for example, uh, and embezzlement of funds at the government level. Uh, so in, in conclusion, I would say he really wasn't expected to be as effective. And more importantly, I think, you know, as he went on, he was not a hated president. He was not a super beloved president. He was just kind of there. He was like a, a lukewarm, you know, political figure. And nobody thought I would say anything particular about him. So it did very much kind of, I think, catch not only the world, but also the citizens of Ukraine by storm when he presented himself as, um, you know, such a, a very loyal leader. Another kind of fun fact about Zelensky here is that he actually natively only speaks Russian. He didn't start learning Ukrainian until he um, became president. Now, in Ukraine, again, it's not uncommon for people to only speak Russian. However, as kind of the um, pro-Ukrainian and, and pro-Ukrainian identity movement has taken root largely in response to Russian aggression, this has become more significant. And so he was made fun of a lot in the very beginning for only speaking Russian and for making mistakes when he spoke Ukrainian, and now he's kind of transformed into uh, the, the ultimate symbol of Ukrainian hope and Ukrainian force. Um, it's, it's a very, very interesting topic. Uh, I definitely recommend that you look more into it, but um, in short, no, <laughs> he was not expected to be as effective. He even caught me surprise, surprise, very pleasant surprise. Um, and I think that fortunately for Ukraine, he is exactly what they needed when they didn't even know that he was what they needed. We have another question from Richard. Since lost, since Russia lost the Crimean War, did not fare well in World War I and lost the Afghan War and the Cold War and all had tremors in Moscow, how do you estimate the future of Putin himself? This is another very challenging question. Um, 
when we talk about the future of Putin, I think there are a few possibilities that everybody's kind of quietly considering in their mind. One of them is that Putin will continue on as he has um, in the form of you know, a very powerful dictator until he dies or becomes too, you know, older, senile to effectively rule anymore. Um, of course, another option would be that he dies of a heart attack tomorrow. Another option would be that Russians um, kind of ousted him, over, overtook him. The problem with all of these is that there are a lot of additional factors that are, are kind of taking place in Russia. So one of them is that uh, Putin has become increasingly more paranoid and he was never really not a paranoid guy. He was, he was you know, a, a KGB operative. So um, he has always been very much on guard, but now he's not allowing anybody near him physically. Um, another thing to note here is that when you have the degree of control that he has over all of his soldiers, would it technically be possible for a group to overwhelm him, um, to, to arrange to assassinate him, for example? Yes, of course it would technically be possible. However, it would require a lot of coordination ahead of time, considering the level of security that he maintains. And that coordination ahead of time is what would be extremely difficult because there are cameras everywhere, people watching the cameras, people watching the people watching the cameras, and so many levels of security that it's just very, very difficult to say. Again, the other part of this is that because all Russian media is state run, uh, there is a really significant portion of Russians that genuinely believe that they are rehashing World War II, fighting off Nazis and trying to protect the Russians and Ukrainians inside of Ukraine from these Nazis. Um, with that said, I mean, obviously it doesn't take all of Russia or all of any country to overthrow a leader, but I think it's very, very difficult to determine at this point. And um, although it's not a very bright or happy thing to say. Another thing that I do genuinely think is that Putin would rather rather see everything destroyed before he would give it up willingly. So a lot of what's going on right now has to do with how he wants his legacy to go down. He's been very, very outspoken about how the Soviet Union and the fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy of our times. He, he envisions himself as another Lenin, as somebody who's going to be rebuilding it and will be spoken about for centuries to come. Um, and so I, I don't know what it would take to um, encourage him to do anything other than rip down the country and the world with him if his death came as anything other than a very abrupt surprise. Um, I, I know that that may have seemed like kind of a cop-out answer, but the, the truth is that it's just so difficult to tell right now with so many different factors and with this, this war, this stage of the war still being in such early stages. We have a question from Megan. How do we know if there are any refugees in our area and how do we find ways to help? This is a great question. Um, you can, first of all, um, look up to see if there are any resettlement um, sites in your area. Usually just Google um, will tell you if there are any. And if you want to help, you can give them a call. I will say right now, there is no protocol for Ukrainian refugees. So as of right now, the United States is not accepting any Ukrainian refugees refugees. What they have done is declared a, um, a state of protection for Ukrainians who are in the United States whose visas would like expire tomorrow, for example. They're allowed to stay and work in the United States for the next 18 months. Um, when we're talking about students, for example, they may not necessarily have anywhere to go. So if you have a Ukrainian church near you, um, that's one resource that you could utilize to see, you know, is there anything that I can donate? Do we have any Ukrainians in need? Otherwise, the only way that Ukrainians are coming over right now is through family-sponsored visas. So if a mother has two sons in Ukraine, she can just, for example, it doesn't have to be a mother and children, she can sponsor a visa to bring them over. It is not a fast process. However, the applications that were already being processed are still being processed. So there are Ukrainians still coming, but not very many. Um, again, I don't know that that will change 
anytime in the immediate future, short of something very dramatically changing in the war. I think right now, um, Biden and also the EU, to be frank, are kind of waiting to see if the war is going to die down on its own, if there's going to be a negotiated solution, um, in which case they should wait and not immediately begin resettling. We have a question from Judy. I've heard about refugees trying to enter the US through Mexico. Is this true? And that any Russian refugees are not being allowed to cross the border. How true is this? And it goes along with what you were saying to not disparage either of these people. Um, so I have actually heard reports that there are Ukrainians who have entered through Mexico. However, it's not exactly um, the way that I think that the news has made it seem. So Ukrainians still need um, a, a visa even just to get to Mexico. So it's not like they can all like hop on a plane en masse. What we're talking about are largely Ukrainians who were either already in Mexico or who already had a visa to get there. And because Ukrainians have been given um, this, this protected status within the United States, some of them, not a very large number, but they are trying to make their way up here to, to be able to make good on that. And they have been accepted from what I saw through the border because they do have that current protected status. Um, as for Russian refugees not being allowed to cross the border, um, I'm not sure about this one. So I also, I, I want to clarify here that when it comes to resettlement, the term refugee and asylee are different. A refugee is someone who has gone through the process with the United Nations, been declared a legal refugee, which means that they have um, a justifiable reason to be fleeing the country that they're going from and have, are, they're entitled, like illegally entitled to be resettled in a safe place. An asylee is somebody who shows up somewhere and requests safety and requests that they can stay there. Um, so as of right now, there are no Russian refugees because Russia isn't recognized as a place that people um, need to actively actively flee from right now. It's not currently uh, included among the, the list of populations that the UN is serving. Russians can come to the United States and and request asylum, and that has happened before. I don't know about any that have been at the um, border with Mexico recently. I, I haven't heard that report, so I would have to look into it. And yes, as you as you mentioned, not you know disparaging of either of them. I think um, that that's that's very important. I think both sides, um, members of both sides, are very scared right now. Does anybody else have questions for Rebecca in chat or does anyone feel brave enough to unmute and just say it right out loud? Um, I mean, you can't see me. It's a simple question, but I was late to be able to join, but it says <laughs> it's recording. Is there like a way that I can like email you and be able to hear the whole thing? Is that? Oh, Diane, I think you're muted. Sorry, it would be helpful if I unmuted to give you that answer. Uh, <laughs> if you send an email to the Peace Public Library account, we will send you a recording of this presentation. Okay. Um, what is the P? Is that just on the online? Will I find that? It's actually peas at peaspubliclibrary.org. Okay. Peas at peaspubliclibrary.org. Got it. Yes. Thank you. On the record now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shana, for putting that in the chat. <laughs> Anyone else? Lots of praise coming in on the chat for an excellent program. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rebecca, if you don't mind, I wanted to share one resource for people to yeah, look at. Yeah, please do. Um, so this is on Russian arrests of civilians. If you look at OVD info, um, I think it's dot or it might be dot com. Um, OVD info dot org. It is entirely in Russian, but Google Translate works fairly well in Russian. That's not true of Ukrainian, by the way. <laughs> Rebecca already knows that. Um, it details people who are being list, arrested around Russia and what they've been arrested for lately. It is protesting. 
um, and they can no longer keep up with all the names they used to publish lists of names and they can't do that anymore. For those who don't know, Nicole and I um, actually knew each other. We went to school together and, uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, and um, some of our classmates have been among the ones who have been arrested or put under house arrest during this. Thank you, Nicole. Well, if no one else has any questions, we'll let Rebecca get on with her evening. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Um, and I hope that you will join us uh, for our next event that we have uh, online. We are always publishing things on our website, peaspubliclibrary.org. And the very best of luck to you, uh, Rebecca, with all your good work that you're doing, uh, reaching out. And uh, can, oh, can you repeat the name of the charity that you recommend? Yeah, put it in there. It's rasmforukraine.org. Rasm, by the way, means together in Ukrainian. So it's together for Ukraine. C O M for Ukraine. Okay. We're getting a lot of thanks to Rebecca. Very interesting and informative. And I would have to to echo those remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Did everyone get the, um, the web address for Razum for Ukraine before I um, end our call? All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice thank you. evening. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks, Rebecca.